So <clears throat> we've had brilliant speakers about how we um, think about, I guess, the academic aspects of interoperability and um, deconstructing it into meaningful language to create a common language for us to understand and share. But um, in the film, I don't know who's seen the film Jerry Maguire with Tom Cruise. And there's a really good scene in there, isn't it, where the, uh, is it the basketball player? Is he a basketball player? And if that's it, right. Um, he wants his money and he's telling uh, uh, Tom Cruise or Jerry Maguire to say, show me the money. So that's that, that bit of the show me the money is so important because without money, we can't really deliver interoperability programs. So our next speaker, <laughs> our next speaker um, is Jocelyn Palmer, who is an expert in delivering uh, transformation interoperability programs and will help share with us insights into how we construct the business case or get people to pay us the money to deliver interoperability programs. And so could you put your hands together for Jocelyn Palmer? Uh, go for it. Hello, everyone. Um, absolutely. So um, we've, we've heard some amazing things. And what I'm going to be talking about is really the real life how do you get an interoperability program up and running? And I'll be talking about it um, from a very practical, I'm part of a health and social care partnership and I work within the NHS. So um, I lead a program called Connecting Care and we are based in Bristol. And um, we have some pedigree, we've been up and running maybe for, I don't know, five or six years, possibly longer. And um, I am also part of uh, the Health Tech Women Network. Um, yeah. <laughs> and we have an event in Bristol next week. So if any of you guys are West Country Way, then please come along. And um, I'm also probably one of the uh, small percentage of people who don't sleep with their smartphone next to their bed, which is something we learned about yesterday. So um, I'm going to talk a bit about the context, first of all, just so that you've got some framework to understand what I'm talking about and where I'm coming from. Um, and then I will talk through a business case on paper, but then perhaps more importantly, a business case in real life. So what's my context? Um, I said already that I actually um, work within the NHS and um, I, um, I run a team and lead a team um, that is uh, co-funded by different people from um, local authorities and different health organisations. Um, and our interoperability work is all about, you know, how can we um, deliver shared care records? How can we do some more work around citizen access, patient access, and, and so on? So the framework for my discussion today, and some of the things I'm going to be talking about from the business case um, context, is on the assumption that there probably are going to be lots of different communities nationally who'll be wanting to do this kind of thing. So very much leading on from what Indy and his team were talking about, um, there will be people and communities who will be saying, we'd like to do some kind of record sharing, or we'd like to do something which is about citizen access um, and um, using our kind of um, uh, sort of uh, story that we had to work with, that idea that as a patient or as a, as a person, I can interact digitally with the people who are involved in my care. So I think that's a common theme and something that um, people will be, that, that we're working on doing and that people um, up and down the country will be doing. So onward, business case on paper. So um, I'm not going to stand here and say this is what your chapter heading should be or this is what a five case business co um, model looks like. Um, you can find that kind of stuff online and there are lots of examples of it. So what I am going to do, however, is talk about um, some real life experiences and lessons and learning. Um, and this is not just from my experience, it's also from other successful intro programs um, nationally um, um, who have been uh, kind enough to share with me their business cases and some of their experiences. So I'll talk about maybe five um, considerations um, around the topic of costs. So the costs for your interoperability program are quite clearly you know, the big thing in your business case. Um, so 
let's start at the top then, but we'll cover briefly buying, recruiting, running, change, and then actually, well, what's the model going to be? So buying, um, people will have different approaches to what they're doing, and some health and care communities may do more making it themselves, uh, or may use more open source um, type of um, work, but, but actually, many times people will use a blend and so there will be some supplier costs that will come into it. Um, often I think that the, the, the costs that people see are perhaps the more, more obvious ones. So for example, um, you, you want to work, you've gone out to procurement and you know that you have to pay for the supplier costs over the next five or seven years. But maybe have a think about other vendor costs. So if you want to perhaps work with uh, 15 vendors who perhaps supply health and social care care record systems in your locality, then likelihood is they won't do that work for free. So we've recently, for example, just finished a project where we went live um, and the whole theme of it was around child safeguarding. Um, and we worked with three local authorities um, and that involved um, three different vendors. So uh, the costs that we had to come up with in terms of, if you like, the business case for that project were the cost, the, those vendor costs and then also how could we support the local authorities themselves and the effort and the people effort that they needed. So do have a think about that when you're, when you're building up your costs. Um, recruiting, so staff and team. Um, you will need people to do this work. Um, and uh, have a think deeply about the range of skills that may be needed. Um, so yeah, you might need somebody like me or you might need a project manager, but you, likely you may also need people who are integration specialists, uh, information governance specialists. Maybe at the beginning you'll need people who are contract specialists uh, or who can help you with negotiating a deal. Um, then maybe when you're up and running you might need people who are capable of managing databases or who can look after your networks for you uh, and so on and so forth. So think about the breadth of talent that you may need um, and be aware that some of those skills may not be present in your typical or average you know, hospital IT department or, or, or so on. So where are you going to find them and where are you going to get them? And some of them may even be quite challenging to get in terms of the open, open market. And um, from an NHS perspective, might be quite expensive. So think about that and, and look to see if you can build some of those into your case. So running costs. So once you've got your um, interop thing up and it's live and it's working, how are you going to keep the show on the road? So uh, sometimes business cases do include a line around this and, and it can sometimes be a little bit cursory. But again, think about the kinds of peoples and the kind of skills that you will need um, that will actually incur costs as you go on. Uh, it, the, these again could be technical skills but they may also be you know fairly straightforward obvious things like if you are managing user licenses and who has access and so on you might need a team of people that look after that you will need people who can support you with information governance throughout the lifetime of your program it absolutely isn't something that you do once and then forget um, and you will need people who you know depending again on what you've created who can manage and look after um, your whole technology set up um, your databases or whatever it might be. So, so think, uh, think fully about what you need in terms of those running costs. Change costs, again, so this, this may come down in terms of people. So do you need, uh, do you need trainers? Um, but perhaps, maybe, there are other types of costs of change. Uh, as you become and move forward on your journey of interoperability, then uh, things like looking at your data quality or trying to improve your data quality um, is something that you may want to do. And that is people and effort and time. So uh, if it's possible when you start to think about the kinds of work you might want to do going forwards, then do. So buying, recruiting, running and change are costs that, that really ought to be in any interop business case um, for a local authority or healthcare organisation that wants to do this stuff. 
Um, but pulling those together and then thinking, well, OK, so how are we going to do it? Um, and there are different approaches. So in some places um, across the country, um, the funding may come from one place, for example, from a commissioning type organization. In other areas, then perhaps um, it could be everybody puts some money into the pot and you share it around. And there are pros and cons for this. So maybe if just uh, the funding comes from one place, it allows other organizations to perhaps feel that they're less involved um, or that it's not really their thing. Um, and if they put money into the pot, then maybe they will, um, in some sense, feel that they have bought into it um, emotionally as well as financially. Um, however, if you take that approach, then you may want to be warned that that could entail a lot of work running around every year, making sure that people are still happy to, to do that and put that money in. So um, those are some real life, real practical um, considerations when you're um, building up the cost element of a business case. So let's look at the benefits, which is the um, exciting and the fabulous stuff and the reason why we want to do interop work. So are they real? So absolutely yes. Um, undoubtedly interop work um, can and, and will um, deliver benefits. So I'll touch on a couple of real life examples and I'm categorizing them from a sort of safety quality uh, or productivity and then um, financial or savings perspective. Um, and then we can just talk maybe a little bit around, well, what might be the challenges around that if you are trying to create your business case. So safeguarding, safety, quality of care, um, this is a common theme in many, many business cases that um, are pulled together around interoperability. Uh, and this is all around perhaps the, what it sounds like the obvious thing, that if you share information from different settings, then actually um, care, whether it's clinical care or social care, uh, is, is, can be safer and better. And so there's a couple of quotes there. So first of all, from Oxford, where people who have been using the Oxfordshire um, care summary overwhelmingly said that it made patient care safer. Um, and then also an example from North Somerset. So um, safeguarding um, can be helped from the sense of somebody seeing a particular example and saying, oh, gosh, I need to involve other agencies now um, so that this person doesn't come to harm. But it, it can also very much be about spotting trends and just realizing that perhaps as a somebody that works in a safeguarding team you need to um, you know raise the level of what you were going to do maybe things like seeing uh, somebody uh, turn up multiple times in an emergency department so um, th this is most definitely an area that I would say um, could and should be in any interop business case um, as can um, efficiency example. So um, efficiency um, essentially is about making better use of people's time. Um, and uh, the nightmare that many people have as part of their daily life, where it's all about phone calls, papers, faxes, still about faxes. And what you do if you can't get hold of the person or you don't know what's involved uh, and so on. And um, I think that that is just a bit of the kind of daily nightmare that many people have to contend with. Um, and interop programs and interop solutions can absolutely make people's lives, working lives better. Um, I, I genuinely had um, a, a call from somebody who said, I don't hate Monday mornings anymore. <laughs> so um, that, 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 that's a personal story, but from a, a service perspective, just look at the, that difference from a pre-op assessment. So down from over um, four hours to a matter of seconds. Um, so um, there are plenty of examples around efficiency that you can use and that you can include in any um, interop business case that you're doing. So cost savings, um, this very much may depend on what you want to deliver and what your focus is of your interrupt program. Um, but you could be looking at things like referrals or duplicate assessments or admissions or, uh, you know, attendances, length of stay. Um, and here are a couple of examples um, from Hampshire um, where they have um, found through studies of use of the Hampshire um, healthcare record that actually length of stay has um, reduced. And then that's been used by Berkshire to actually make the case within their business case for a million pounds worth of savings. Um, likewise, Berkshire have taken other examples and extrapolated that for um, savings around admissions and end of life, they could, um, um, you know, over, over three million. So um, there are definitely um, 
examples where uh, interop can support um, cost savings in NHS and local authority organisations. Um, sometimes there's a challenge around that, um, and I would say that you know we'll talk about this in a second. But um, maybe one of the key challenges to note just here is that um, the fact that something is cost saving doesn't necessarily mean that you can kind of take take that money out. So it may not be cash releasing, even if it has a financial figure associated with it. So when you're pulling together your business case, you may well need to look at examples um, so that you can make the case for that there being good evidence for why you can deliver these benefits or why your cost might be this amount. And truly, there are global examples. Um, so whether you wanted to you know, like look in New Zealand or in Scandinavia or in Spain or in Scotland or in Northern Ireland or in the north of England or in London or in the southern parts of England, there are tons of examples that you can look at and that are available uh, where people are doing amazing things and getting amazing benefits so we certainly when we were doing the business case for connecting care looked at other examples and I would um, um, urge you to do the same so um, what might be some of the challenges so absolutely um, these are challenging times to be asking for an investment if you are um, in a local authority and you've just made a ton of social workers redundant uh, or you've just had to close a load of beds in a hospital, then this could be, um, this could be tricky. And actually talking to uh, a you know, director of finance and saying, we need you to make this investment, it's hard work. So there's no other way to, to say about that. Um, and I think that um, where you may gain an advantage is if your interop program is actually linked into a wider clinical or, or other kind of care transformation program. So very much um, um, geographies that have got that in place, and I've spoken to colleagues, for example, in um, Gloucester and Berkshire, who have got interoperability very much as part of looking at how their health and care community works. Um, then um, I would say that, that that can be an advantage and also means that you can um, get away from the difficulty of people expecting that your interoperability programme magically, all by itself, with no other change, will deliver all the benefits that you need. Okay, so that's a business case on paper. So just a couple of things then about business case in real life. Um, and uh, let's look at benefits and continuing that theme. So it's really worth asking yourself as you go through the process of creating your business case, do you know what you've got to do to deliver the benefits in real life? Um, I've mentioned the kind of, well, can interoperability do this all magically? And, and oftentimes it can't. So um, consider what, you know, what is the change that has to happen in human terms as well as technical terms. Energy. Um, most people will not be thinking that an interop program is just a one-year thing. So how do you keep the energy going over five years, seven years, ten years? And how do you do that when actually um, you know, the landscape is changing, the technical landscape is changing, maybe different you know, uh, health organisations are merging or unmerging or whatever, um, and politically and financially as well things change. So um, it, it's really worth thinking about whether your interop program is built on personalities and people that want to work together, or are you actually going to implement some form of um, contractual or legal or kind of understanding between the different parties that are involved in this? Um, and if you want, um, uh, somebody from a, a hospital or a local authority to be doing some data sharing, then how do you, um, you know, keep those obligations and, and, and keep your program going year on year on year? Um, so that kind of notion of what a local authority or, or a trust may want to do, um, do think about your different perspectives um, and um, what might be the case for an individual hospital to be interoperable or for a GP or for a vendor? It might very much be 
challenging if you just look at it from a single perspective, um, because these are organisations that have their own priorities or their own financial challenges, uh, or perhaps it's their, their their business model for um, you know if 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 you're a vendor, you know what what's you know why would you want to be interoperable, um, and you know the different gives and gets, people's competing priorities, um, and so on is is a real factor to consider as your business case becomes real and as your interoperability program continues. Um, and um, we certainly, and I have personally certainly had examples where people will say, well, what's the point? What's in it for me? Um, and this is um, where I think if you say, okay, you've got all of this stuff happening, you've managed to get your business case on paper, but really your landscape's continually moving, um, you've got competing priorities, um, there's this really tough thing called cross-organisational working where how do you actually work together with different partners in your health and care system, um, how do you get the benefits, how do you keep the energy and I think fundamentally um, a business case can't just be a business case that's a piece of paper. Um, it's really important to think about the leadership that's needed for um, owning and driving and, and keeping that business case moving forward and making it a real life thing. And I think that's essentially at the heart of it. Um, when I say leadership, I don't just mean, you know, some big cheese up there, um, although that is important. It's also about the leadership the whole way down and, and, and to think of, you know, the partnership of people working on it and where you need to, to show and display leadership. And um, you really about your, your, your business case being a living thing, which is essentially about um, how we do the right thing, how we do the right thing for our patients and public, how we continue to work together across borders and across organisational boundaries, even when it's tough, and how we're really relentless about that, because that's what's best for, um, for our public and for our patient care. So... Just wrapping up now, and um, just five things really that I would say. Um, so think deeply about your costs. So deeply, and uh, and in terms of the, the 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 breadth of the different kinds of costs, and don't be simplistic when it comes to looking at the costs that are involved in an interop program on the ground in real life. It's probably more than you think. Um, Try and be clear about what you're actually aiming for. And if you can make your interop program part of an overall clinical or care transformation program, then that is so, so much the better um, so that it's seen as being the, the framework or architecture to help enable some really good things happen. Research your benefits, try and keep them simple. Um, and when you're trying to get your business case over the line, but also ongoing, Think about the people and um, manage the people, manage the energy um, and, you know, work to create a good collaborative atmosphere where people are doing this for, for patient care. Think about the commitment that you'll need year on year on year. Sometimes you will have tough years. We did last year. And um, sometimes you may want to give up. So um, that's why considering your business case as a real life um, as a real life living beast, as well as just a piece of paper, is one of my key um, recommendations and my takeaways. So, thank you, and good luck to those of you who are looking at creating business cases or who want to do interrupt programs. I wish you every success, and um, I hope you enjoy it as well. Thanks. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, Justin, for, for sharing that, and uh, please don't give up. Uh, we need a lot more people like you, and I, I love the way how you showed so many examples of a lot of other, other integrated geo care records elsewhere, and I, I thank you for that, because it shows the kind of collaborative environment that we do work in the NHS, and you embody a lot of the values. And you mentioned something about managing energy and interoperability. Um, that's what I've been doing the last five months with Amir sitting there, managing his energy. 